on modules, it should take you directly to the unit four module. And then you'll be able to scroll down to unit four day three. Today is February 16th and you'll be able to complete the warm up there. So we've got six minutes per usual. Go ahead and knock it out. I'll put myself on mute and, and we'll finish. We'll, we'll get started when you guys are done.
All right, folks, so that was six minutes. Hopefully that was plenty of time. I saw it looks like only five of you did the warm up. Um, but obviously you all know that your timeline allows you until the end of the unit to get all of your assignments in. These warm ups, again, you've heard me say it before, but I'll say it once more. These warm ups are very important because they give you an opportunity to take a look at what some of the test questions will be. Um, and you should want to get as much exposure to the test questions before the test as possible. Um, so let's just take a look at a few of these questions and it looks like a sixth person has now done them as well. Actually, let me go back. Let me do it like this. Student view, share this tab. All right, so this is what it looks like for you all, right? So you click on the warm up. It tells you how many points, how many questions, no time limit. You can take it as many times as you want. Again, that's there for you all to use it as a study tool for the rest of the semester. So this first question asks, how do molecules move into and out of most animal cells? Well, we know that each of these things that's mentioned here is an organelle, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the cell membrane, the cell wall, all four of those are organelles. They are parts of cells. Uh, two things here that I wanna point out. Number one, we should know the function of all four of these organelles. We should know what they do. So if we're unsure as to what they do, then we need to go back to unit two and kind of freshen up a little bit on our knowledge about those organelles. Uh, for example, a cell wall is providing protection and support and structure but the special thing about cell walls is that they don't appear in animal cells. This question asks specifically about animal cells. Animal cells do not have cell walls. So that should be, you know, one answer choice already that we can eliminate. So this one can't be right. Now we're thinking about the other three. What does a nucleus do? What do mitochondria do? What does a cell membrane do? Well, just to make it a little bit quicker, because I want to get to the rest of the lesson, the cell membrane's job is to control what comes in and what goes out of the cell. So that one is a pretty easy and obvious answer to this. Question two, cell membranes allow some molecules to move freely across the membrane, while other molecules are restricted. Which term best describes this capability of a cell membrane? We talked about this briefly yesterday, but I'm going to bring it up again today. Uh, as we review yesterday, I know we covered a lot over the course of yesterday's lesson, but the, the cell membrane has some unique qualities. We talked about this yesterday. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer. We also talked about the fact that it is uh, a mosaic because it has a lot of different things embedded inside of it. We talked about the fact that it is fluid because it can move around and shift shapes and the things that are embedded inside of it can actually change locations. And then the last quality that we talked about a cell membrane having is the fact that it is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable. And that just means, that's just a fancy word of saying that it's picky. The cell membrane is semi-permeable because it decides that only some things can come through and only at certain times. That's what this word semi-permeable means. Yes, it's permeable. Yes, things can move through it, but it's semi because only certain things can. Question three, which is the most accurate model to show how amino acids form proteins? I love this question because it gets you thinking about an analogy. Which of these models is most similar to how an amino acid chain formed? That's an important word, chain. We wanna think about chains here. So pieces in a jigpaw, jigsaw puzzle, excuse me, do not form chains because each piece is gonna be connected to at least two other pieces. So we can't really describe that as being a chain. Petals on a flower, 
that's doesn't that's not a chain either. We can peel off petals of a flower from one another. They're not really linked together in a chain. Bees in a hive are not connected at all. They might live together, but they are not actually fused together. So the only option here that works is cars on a train. So we're talking about train cars. We're not talking about if I were to drive an actual vehicle and park it on a train. We're talking about each segment of the train that is connected. So that is the best analogy when we think about a comparison to how amino acids form proteins. And then the last question from the warm up: what determines the order of amino acids in a protein? This is a question that we have to keep coming back to because this is one of our lowest performing standards. So you will continue to see me put questions like this one into the warmups. We had one yesterday for those of you who did yesterday's warmup, but standard 4.1.2, which talks about how DNA codes for proteins continues to be one of those standards that we struggle with. That's not abnormal. Our students do typically struggle with standard 4.1.2 until unit five, when we actually talk about this process of what's called protein synthesis. So I think going into our next unit, which will start on Monday, you all will start to get a better understanding of that standard. But because it is a standard that we introduce in unit one, it's one that we continue to see and, and face through the rest of the semester. So it's one that we need to get as much practice with. It does come up a lot on the EOC exam. So it's just in general, this standard just talks about the idea that DNA is the instruction manual. And that instruction manual codes for proteins. The process is more complicated than that. But really, if you can remember that statement, you put yourself in a really good place. So again, this question asks, what determines the order of amino acids in a protein? The only answer choice that even has this phrase DNA in it is answer choice B, the sequence of amino, I'm sorry, the sequence of nucleotides in DNA. And that is the correct answer. If you change the sequence of the nucleotides in DNA, so instead of ATC, if I make it ATG or TAC, once I change that sequence, then I'm ultimately also going to change the, the amino acids and therefore I'm changing the protein. So it's kind of like a, uh, a domino effect of sorts. If I change one thing, then everything that comes after that is potentially going to be changed as well. If I knock down one domino, the other dominoes that come after it are also going to be knocked down. The, now the dominoes that come before it probably aren't going to be affected. If I've got a domino, uh, if I've got dominoes lined up in a group of 10, and I knock down the fourth one, then dominoes one through three are probably still standing, but dominoes four through 10 are probably knocked down. Same thing happens in this process. If I start off with nucleotides of DNA, then I get to a DNA chain, then I get to mRNA, then I get to amino acids, then the protein. We'll talk, all, we'll talk about that in the next unit. If I knock down something, everything that comes after that is probably going to be messed up. So just keep that in mind. All right, so I need you guys to get in the habit of doing these warmups, using the time that you are given. Of course, they're only worth two points. They're four questions long, so they should be quick and they're not worth that many points in the grade book, but they really go a long way in terms of preparing you to perform well on your EOC exam as well as our unit exams. All right, let's jump back into the notes. So the title of today's lesson, which you should write down in your notes, is Types of Cellular Transport. What I'm noticing when I'm meeting with students one-on-one -on -one is that I'm having to go over concepts and, and, and talk about things that I've talked about in class before, which tells me that you all are either A, not writing down notes, or B, you're not telling me that I'm moving too fast. If I go a little bit too fast and you miss something, that's on me. Just let me know, just say, hey, Mr. Rudd, can you go back a slide? Or, hey, Mr. Rudd, can you explain that one more time? No big deal, I'm happy to do that. But we've got to be ready and willing to write things down as soon as we see this slide, including the title of the lesson, including the date, and in, in some cases, including the objective and or the essential question. So 
today's date again is February 16th, 2021. It's the third day of our fourth unit. We've got an objective today. It says students will be able to explain ways that organisms use released energy for maintaining homeostasis. This is a process called active transport. We'll learn more about that, but we've got to hone in on this idea of released energy today. Yesterday, we talked about homeostasis. We defined it as maintaining an internal balance, a stable internal balance. Homeo is a phrase, it's a prefix that means man, and then stasis means stable. So you want the inside of a body, the inside of a cell to be stable, to maintain levels of temperature, pH, sugar, water, pressure. And then the essential question that we will seek to answer by the end of today's lesson, how does the cell membrane facilitate the transport of materials into and out of the cell? So it does this transport in several different ways. We're gonna talk about those several different ways today. And there are some important differences between them. So I'll leave this up for about 10 more seconds to give folks an opportunity to write down whatever they need to. Okay, so we had to quickly skip over the slide as we were running out of time at the end of yesterday's lesson, but I do want you all to write this chart down. So we're gonna leave this up for about two minutes. We're gonna leave this up for about 120 seconds to give you all an opportunity to write it down. The question is, which molecules can cross the membrane easily? And when we say easily, we mean without any help. They just kind of move across by themselves. So this column on the left is talking about those molecules that can move freely without any help. Small molecules are able to move by themselves. They don't need any additional help. Non-polar molecules do not need any additional help. We won't talk about exactly what that means. That's a chemical term, a chemistry term that you'll learn more about next year when you take chemistry. Uncharged molecules, or otherwise known as neutral molecules, they do not have, they don't carry a charge, an electrical charge. These molecules are able to move across the membrane without any help as well. And then there are some examples provided to you at the bottom. Oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and methane, CH4 is methane. On the other hand, there are larger molecules that need some additional help. And this help might be in the form of a tunnel through the cell membrane, which we can see on the right. Typically, that's a protein channel. It, it, it is able to move the larger molecules through the membrane. Or it might come through an added source of energy, which we'll talk more about today. But these larger molecules, they need some help. Polar molecules also need some help. Again, that's a chemical term that you'll learn more about next year, polarity. Charged molecules, otherwise known as ions. These are atoms that have a, an electrical charge. These are not able to move by themselves through the membrane. They do need some help. And then lastly, you're also given some examples there at the bottom. NaCl, that's salt. Salt needs some help getting across the membrane. C6H12O6, that's glucose, that's sugar. It's going to need some help getting across the membrane. 
And we'll talk about what this help looks like today. So I'm gonna leave this up for about 30 more seconds to give you guys an opportunity to write down this chart. This chart is going to be very helpful to you as we go through today's lesson. Okay. Cool. We'll not do that right now. Okay, so we discussed yesterday, but in order for these organisms to maintain homeostasis, they must be able to move different molecules across the membrane. So homeostasis is a concept that applies to the cellular level it is an individual cell's job to maintain a balance and again it might be a balance of salt nacl it might be a balance of water h2o it might be a balance of glucose c6 h12o6 it might be a balance of oxygen or carbon dioxide but it is an individual cell's job. And so that individual cell has to be able to move molecules across its membrane. We might need to take in more glucose. We might need to push out oxygen or carbon dioxide. So we can see in this cool animation on the right, certain smaller molecules are able to just move really easily through the membrane but these larger green molecules are just bouncing off. They're too big to get through the membrane or they might have a chemical charge or they might be polar, but for whatever reason, they can't move through the membrane by themselves. On the other side, in this more complicated animation, we see a lot going on here, but you can also take note of the fact that there are some things that move through the membrane. These big proteins here, these are receptors that are gonna be able to bind to something on the outside of the cell and then cause a reaction on the inside of the cell. So this cell membrane, even though we only mention it briefly in unit two, is such an important part of life because it needs to be able to maintain homeostasis. So in general, there are two types of transport. The first type of transport that we will discuss is called passive transport. Passive transport allows molecules to move with their concentration gradient. In other words, it allows molecules to move from areas of high concentration down to areas of low concentration. That's an easy process to do, so it doesn't require any energy. It would be like rolling down the hill. If you're at the high region of the hill and you're trying to get to the low region of the hill, you could literally just lay down and allow gravity to just pull you down. It doesn't require any real energy. You're moving from a high concentration region to a low concentration region. So energy is not required to do that. And again, we talked about concentration a little bit yesterday, but all it means really is it's a measure of how much of something there is in a given space. So if there's a lot more oxygen outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell, that oxygen is gonna flow into the cell. 
It's going to move by itself passively without energy from a region of high concentration to the region of low concentration. Again, I encourage you all to write down at least at the very minimum the things that are highlighted in yellow. And you should also write down the title of this slide, Passive Transport. There are different types of passive transport as well. For example, there is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion allows molecules to move without any help. So these would be the smallest molecules, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen. These are really small nonpolar molecules. Keep in mind though, all of these, all three of these types of passive transport can happen without any additional input of energy. Passive transport does not require cellular energy. Keep that in mind. Facilitated diffusion allows for the movement of molecules with the help of a channel protein. A channel protein is basically just a tunnel that kind of burrows through the cell membrane allowing for larger molecules to move from one side to the other. Thanks, Shadow. So examples of molecules that need the help of a channel protein, glucose, which is C6H12, O6, salt, and then other large and or polar molecules. There's a special type of transport that is used for water. And this type of transport is called osmosis. You've probably heard this word before. Osmosis specifically describes the transport or the movement of water through the membrane. And osmosis also requires a special type of channel protein that's called an aquaporin. You can see that word down there at the bottom, it's underlined, an aquaporin. Osmosis only applies to the movement of water. We don't use that word to discuss the movement of any other substances across the membrane. Osmosis is just for water. So anytime you see a question about the movement of water through the membrane or across the membrane, you should instantly be thinking about osmosis. Again, I want to encourage you all to write at the very minimum what you see highlighted in yellow. And all of these are different types of passive transport. So none of them require the input of any cellular energy. They don't require energy. They move from regions of high concentration to low concentration. 
Okay. So here's passive transport. We can see diffusion on the left. This is a cool animation from the Amoeba sisters. On the left, we can see that molecule. It's kind of like a fuchsia pink color moving through the membrane by itself. It doesn't need any help. It's just It just kind of diffuses through the membrane. On the right side, we see facilitated diffusion. It looks kind of like a hot dog bun, but in reality, what you're looking at is a channel protein, and it's allowing that purple substance, that purple molecule to move through the membrane, but it's giving them some help to do so. For whatever reason, they can't move by themselves, so they need the help of that channel protein. So that's a cool animation to demonstrate the difference between diffusion and facilitated diffusion. But in general, passive transport, like I said, is like rolling down a hill, or it's like rolling a bowling ball down a hill. It does not require any energy. So let's say you've got your bowling ball and you wanna just measure how quickly it can get down the hill. All you need to do at the top of that hill is just give it a little bit of a nudge and the ball is gonna be moved by gravity through the rest of the process. So let's watch that one more time. This is passive transport. No additional energy input is needed. You don't have to, you don't have to follow the ball down the hill and give it a nudge every inch or every foot. It just needs that little bit of nudge to get from the area of high concentration, like at the top of the hill, to an area of low concentration, like at the bottom of the hill. And it just does that by itself. No additional input of energy needed. Okay. Of course, the opposite type of transport, the inverse of passive is active. Active transport is going to move molecules against their concentration gradient. So let me go back really quickly. Passive transport moves molecules with its concentration gradient, with their concentration gradient. Active moves them against their concentration gradient. So this means we're going from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. Doing that requires a lot of energy, just like running up a hill would require a lot of energy. The energy that is required to do this is called ATP. We've talked about this before. We know that respiration is the process that allows mitochondria to make ATP. But we need energy to move molecules from low regions of concentration to higher concentration regions. And we can see that in these animations here. In order to move from a region where there's a low concentration, I can only see two of these green squares into a region where there appear to be at least 12, it's gonna take energy. There aren't that many over here, and there are a lot over here. I always like the analogy, too, of thinking about being at a house party. Some of you may never have been to a house party. Some of you maybe have, or a family reunion of sorts. If, there's a, if there are a whole bunch of people standing in the kitchen, there are 20 people in the kitchen, and there are only five people standing in the dining room, then that dining room area is less concentrated. It feels a lot less crowded. In order to push your way into the kitchen, let's say you're trying to get to the wings or something. In order to do that, it's going to take a lot of energy. You're going to have to maneuver around a lot of people. So to go from the less crowded region to a much more crowded region takes energy. Here are some types of active transport. I will ask that you all write these down, but we won't talk about them specifically. All types of active transport require the input of energy. They require the input of ATP, which is cellular energy. 
So a sodium potassium pump requires energy. You can see that word pump, I bolded it, because when you see that word pump, you should be thinking about using energy. Pumping something means you're using energy. The excretion of toxins, so to remove toxins from the cell, that also requires energy. Synthesized molecules. Synthesized molecules that are made inside of the cell and then need to be moved outside of the cell, that requires energy. And then this process of exocytosis and endocytosis. We can see that happening here. Some type of protein is trying to enter the cell. And so a little bit of the cell membrane is going to kind of form a boat around this protein so that now it's inside of the cell. This is called endocytosis. If it were going the opposite way, leaving the cell, then it would be called exocytosis. So write down these types of active transport. We, we don't need to know specifically what they do but we should just be familiar with the fact that they do require energy. Okay. Okay, so same situation here. We've got a hill. This time we're talking about active transport. There's a region of low concentration at the bottom of the hill and a region of high concentration at the top of the hill. Because this is active transport, this would be like pushing the ball up the hill from the region of low to the region of high. In order to do that, we're going to require a lot of energy. So it's not going to be nearly as easy to get this ball up the hill as it would be to get it back down the hill. So you start to struggle a little bit. And in order to get some more energy, maybe you should eat some carbs. Why would you eat carbs to get some more energy? What kind of what do carbs do? What do carbohydrates do? What's the function of a carbohydrate? No, carbs don't give you protein. Proteins are something totally different. Yes, Rudy has it right. They give you a quick boost of energy. So carbs, for example, like glucose, carbs end in OSE typically, sugars. They give you that quick boost of energy and your body can use that glucose or those carbs to undergo respiration, to make ATP. The goal here is to make ATP to be used by your cells. All right. So I like to think about active transport in a group of A. A for active transport, A for ATP, and A for against the gradient, meaning from low to high concentration. The three A's, active transport, ATP, against the gradient.
active transport ATP against the gradient. So if you can remember those three A's, you are in a good spot. So if you're going with the crowd, this crowd is trying to flood this store for Black Friday, you're moving with the crowd. Let's say you're kind of in the middle of that crowd. You're just getting pushed. It's not really requiring any energy on your part. Somebody is pushing you into this door. So this would be like passive transport. It's not requiring any energy. You're moving from a region that's really crowded, a high concentrate, highly concentrated region to a region that is very open. It's less dense. It's a low concentrated region. So that's passive. But if you're going the other way, you're trying to get outside. Let's say this employee who kind of runs out of the way. Let's say he was trying to get outside the store. That's going to require huge amounts of energy to kind of shove your way through people to avoid getting knocked over. So that would be active transport. You're moving from a region that is low density, low concentration to a region of higher density where it's clearly very crowded outside of the store. OK, let's take a look at this and then you guys will have time for your asynchronous assignment. So we've got a region inside of the cell. This is called the intracellular region. We've, we can see that the cell has a membrane. Then we've got a region called that is outside of the cell, and that's called the extracellular region. Extra is a prefix that means outside. So extracellular region. Inside of the cell, we've got some carbon dioxide, and we've also got some oxygen. Outside of the cell, we've got uh, some carbon dioxide, and we've also got some oxygen. So let's see. In what direction will the oxygen molecules move in order to achieve equilibrium here? Are the oxygen molecules, these pink circles, going to move into the cell, or are they going to move out of the cell? Are these oxygen molecules going to leave the cell or are these oxygen molecules going to enter the cell? Which direction are we moving, into or out of? I heard someone say inside. Um, OK, so let's think about this a little bit more. We've got five oxygen molecules, I'm sorry, six oxygen molecules inside of the cell. One, two, three, four, five, six. And outside of the cell, it's hard to see this one down here, but we've got one, two, three. So we've got six inside and three on the outside. In order to achieve equilibrium, equilibrium means that we want the same number on the inside and on the outside. We want them to be equal. So in order to achieve equilibrium, we're going to have to get rid of some of the oxygen on the inside of the cell. That oxygen is going to need to leave and go out here. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five inside of the cell. And we've got one, two, three, four outside of the cell. So we still have a little bit too much on the inside of the cell. So this oxygen is going to leave as well. Now we've got one, two, three, four oxygen molecules inside of the cell, and one, two, three, four, five oxygen molecules outside of the cell. So now what we've established is that it's going to be impossible for them to be equal at any one point. What's going to happen is that one of these oxygen molecules is just going to kind of keep going back and forth in and out of the cell. This is what we call dynamic equilibrium. There are still changes taking place. 
That's why it's dynamic. This oxygen is still moving. It's going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's still dynamic. It's still moving. But we're at equilibrium now because they're essentially equal on both sides. We've got the same amount of oxygen on both sides of the cell now. Okay. Now let's think about the carbon dioxide. In what direction will those molecules move? Will they move into the cell or out of the cell? Are these carbon dioxide molecules going to move into or out of the cell? What do you all think? Somebody give me an answer, please. Cheese Bob. Your first answer is right, Jason. I don't know what Cheese Bob is, but thanks for that little comedy there. Um, these molecules, these carbon dioxide molecules are going to move inside. Guys, we've got to think about this. We talked about this yesterday as well. The molecules want to be at equilibrium. That's the goal. The cell will only stop when it's, once it has reached an equilibrium. We want equal amounts typically on both sides of the cell. We want there to be as much inside as there is outside. We want the concentrations of both sides of the membrane to be the same. That's the whole point of this transport. We want to maintain homeostasis. We want to be at balance. In order to do that, we need to accomplish equilibrium. So carbon dioxide, inside of the cell, we've got one, two. Outside of the cell, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got a lot of moving to do here to move towards equilibrium. We've got seven CO2 molecules outside and only two inside. So this one's got to go in. This one's got to go in. Oops. Now we've got four inside of the cell. And before we kind of got rid of that, we would have six left out on the inside. So we really would need one more to move inside of the cell too. But my question now is what kind of transport was just taking place? Those of you who have been taking notes should definitely have written this down. If we're talking about the movement of really small molecules like O2 and like CO2, what kind of transport is that? Is it active transport or is it passive transport? What, it, what is active, and I can hear somebody talking, and I see Jason said something in the chat, but what is active transport? What does, what's the difference between active and passive transport? Come on, people, we've got to be, 
you know, we're not uh, we're not just talking for our health here. We we need to we need to be paying close attention, closer attention than this. No, we're not talking about toxins at all. That never came up. It's not a part of this question. Okay, thank you for being honest. Anybody else? What have we been talking about for the last 30, 40 minutes, 45 minutes? Is it because the molecules are pumped against the concentration? Okay, thank you, Brianna. So um, Brianna knows that active transport Requires for mole requires molecules being pumped. That's a good word to describe active transport because pumping requires energy. But we didn't see any pumping here. Another difference between active and passive transport is that active transport moves molecules against. Remember those three A's. Active transport requires ATP, and it moves molecules against their gradient. Against the gradient means from low to high concentration, from low to high. We didn't move from low to high in this, in, this, um, in this example. If we were moving from low to high, then the oxygen on the outside of the cell would move into the cell. But that's not what happened. We saw the oxygen move from high to low. That's passive transport. We then saw the carbon dioxide move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's passive transport. Specifically, it's simple diffusion. So passive transport, folks, is when we're moving from the top of the hill to the bottom. It doesn't require any energy. All we're saying is that we're moving from high concentration to low concentration. We're moving from an area where there are a lot of the molecules to an area where there is very, there are very few molecules. That's high to low. Okay. So you guys really need to practice with this clearly. Um, I, I, I'm not getting as much participation as I need to. So I'm gonna have to leave it up to these assignments to get you guys where you need to be. So this cellular transport practice is the new assignment for today. We can see that we have three other assignments that have been assigned over the last two days of this unit on Friday and on Monday. We also have an exit ticket. So you should be using your time wisely to do at least one of those things, starting with probably the exit ticket and then moving to an asynchronous assignment. I'll be here on mute if you have questions for me. Folks, I can see some of you are still looking at this screen. We should be headed over to Canvas to get the assignments done. There's no need to still be looking at this Google Meet screen. <laughs> 